Since 1972, the McIlvaney Financial Group has been a conservative, contrarian investment firm. With that mindset, they have created a multifaceted approach to portfolio management, offering a wide array of services including hedging through precious metals, wealth advising, a unique short fund, and an excellent educational resources. We have had David McIlvaney on our show multiple times because we respect his outlook, viewpoints, and recommendations. You really need to take advantage of the free portfolio risk analysis and bank safety ratings they're offering our listeners. Just call them at 1-800-525-9556, and you will be put in touch with an advisor with years of experience who can take 15 minutes and give you a much better understanding of what true portfolio diversification is. Again, call them at 1-800-525-9556 and benefit from their expertise. Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barrick of Wall Street from Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street from Main Street podcast interview. Joining us today is a first-time guest. He is editor of the Wealth Research Group. He's been investing since the age of 16. He considers himself a thrill-seeking entrepreneur, and he's traveled to over 30 countries, kind of like Jim Rogers. And uh, his company, Wealth Research Group, finds well-researched companies for subscribers. Lior Gantz, thank you for joining me today. Hey, thanks, Jason. Thanks for being here. Now, Lior, uh, Trump, uh, President Trump's first 100 days are over now. Has President Trump done anything so far that you've liked? Um, interesting question. Uh, the the immediate answer would be I don't think he has done anything substantial, and he's not taken advantage of the political capital and the momentum he had coming in from the elections. He It seems like he has so much – mess that he has had to in, to inherit that he's I don't think he's finding the the right direction yet he's trying to um, tackle all of the major issues like healthcare like tax reform uh, you know he's trying to show China that uh, the United States is still the superpower um, and, and he's uh, trying to move forward on on the wall and defense etc um, Look, it's only been 100 days out of a four-year candidacy, right? So you, you got to build this correctly as a president. I wouldn't dare step into his mind and trying to think what he has to think on a daily basis. But as an investor um, and, and as a saver, I think the, the tax reform is by far the most important element of, uh, of interest to anyone who is uh, uh, looking to adjust his portfolio to the Trump era, right? I would like to see him get the tax cuts, but I'm worried, though, that he'll put tariffs in in place, which will, you know, make things a lot worse for regular mainstream people. Uh, you know, if the, he puts in a 15 or 20 percent VAT tax, uh, the average uh, person on Main Street is going to really hurt their standard of living uh, for the things that they need every day. But, um, you know, to add to some of your points there, yeah about you know the mess he inherited i've lived i'm not sure if you're familiar with my situation but i've lived right outside of washington dc now since the year 2000 so i'm pretty familiar with the political climate i don't like either political party i didn't vote for trump uh I, i'm glad he won instead of hillary, hillary clinton because hillary probably wouldn't have allowed us to even have this conversation <laughs> but um you know every uh, there seems in dc Lior, every couple of years there's a hope and change candidate that comes here whether it's obama or trump or guys in congress that promise you know change like real significant change and the corrupt uh, parasitical bureaucratic class, the intelligentsia here, the machine that makes a lot of money with either party running, you know, whether it's the military industrial complex or the lobbyists, sure. those guys don't want change. They want, you know, maybe sure. a, a little bit of change on the periphery here, there. They want basically, you know, the same thing to run. So when Trump, you know, kind of played ball with the serious strikes, uh, you know, look at the people who are congratulating him, Hillary Clinton, MSNBC, the mainstream media, uh, John McCain, Lindsey Graham, you know, people on both sides of the aisle that Trump basically and a lot of the people who supported him hated. So, um, you know, it's, sure. I, I, I knew, I, I feel that the uh, swamp is winning <laughs> and that I don't think he's going to be able to drain the swamp, unfortunately. Well, well, Jason, here, here's, here's a few things to consider, right? Um, first of all, the underlying theme is that no, you know, no institution in the world that large, like the United States government should ever be run by so many people with so many opinions over such a short period of time. Uh, take S and P 500 companies, 
take large companies that, that generate uh, results, and you'll see that the CEOs are not being replaced that fast. Like a four-year uh, um, position is something that is very unique. I mean, what kind of a company changes the CEO altogether every four years? So uh, um, we look at the debt and, and the national debt of the U.S., and, and you're thinking to yourself, how can somebody opt in and out of this uh, uh, position every four years and look at all the people who have gone through this, uh, Bush, Clinton, um, the other Bush, uh, Reagan, etc. They do not mean anything anymore to the U.S. economy. They do not advise. They do not cut. It, it's very different than how you really want to run such a large machine. Think of, uh, of company where uh, the CEO has been around the company for like 30, 40 years, its, it's entire life is revolved around the company, then he comes in. So when you see the presidency, it's a very unique situation um, because everyone comes with their own fresh ideas and then boom, you've got uh, uh, the, the, uh, well, the, the motivation to create large change. And with Trump, what you gotta realize is income tax and payroll tax they represent 80% of government revenues. So when he proposes tax reform to corporate tax, um, you know that's that's not going to affect the main street uh, people, like you say. That's going to affect people who have see-through entities, corporations. People who are going to hide their uh, well, not hide, but incorporate their assets into um, uh, these uh, you know shelters that uh, that Trump is creating for a specific type. Uh, of a person or an institution, uh, these corporate taxes will probably allow a $1 trillion that's offshore right now from Qualcomm, uh, Google, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Cisco. Uh, these five all put together own uh, the majority of the cash of, of the U.S. Uh, economy. And the, it's mostly outside the country. If he reduces it to 15%, the idea is that will spur economic activity within the U.S. because each of these companies will invest in their own businesses in the U.S., create jobs, right, uh, wages will rise, etc. Or they will dish out dividends. The economy will um, flourish through that. But, Jason, this is a risk. This is a game. This, you know, it, it's not scientific at all. You never know what's going to happen once you lower taxes because lowering taxes means more pressure and more responsibility on the average person. Um, when the U.S. had no income tax, nothing. It's not like the U.S. was uh, uh, full of 100% people that are rich. There's poverty even in a tax system when there's no, when there's no tax at all on your income. It's much better because you can choose what to do with your money 100%. But tax going down or up will not um, uh, change significantly the, the people on Main Street. Um, the, the reason is most people, um, uh, employees and middle class people and, and, and lower incomes, they, no matter what the tax bracket is, they usually spend about 86 cents out of every dollar earned. That's the way they, they, they live. And so lowering taxes will make life better for the rich but will definitely not affect the lower incomes uh, in a great level. And, and he's not doing it. The reason he cannot um, lower payroll tax and income tax is because those are the revenues that pay for the Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. It's, it's you know, mathematically impossible to do it. But the biggest risk, in my opinion, Jason, is the fact that Trump just signaled to China, to Russia, to the EU, and to Japan, the largest foreign holders of United States debt, that he basically is telling him, look, we own the system. We own the credit system. We own the money system. Every dollar in, in origination comes from us. We dictate the rules as long as the dollar is the reserve currency. And therefore, I'm going to cut taxes and print and print and print and print. And you're going to buy it. You're going to come to the auctions and buy it. Why? Because you don't want to stop doing that, because that's that's like a that's detrimental for them as well, right? Two three trillion dollars um, is held in China. They're not going to stop coming to the auctions because it's like uh, uh, well, they want to keep the value of their 
holdings uh, relatively high uh, and until they find a way to move out of the dollar system, which obviously people have been talking about for, for decades, but it, 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 it can still be 10 to 15 years away. The dollar can still devalue more and more and more and erode the purchasing power of the, of the middle class and the lower class and, and the guy on Main Street. Um, and I think uh, Trump has taken a big risk by just bluntly saying to these uh, uh, foreign governments that, hey, um, I'm going to do it. It's going to help the U.S. economy and you're going to pay for it by buying our, our treasury bills. Um, China's already opted out of 30-year bonds gradually and they're moving into five and two year bonds which basically means that they're playing with you right if a bank would come to you jason and will tell you look i'm going to loan you money for two years instead of five and uh, that's going to put much more pressure on you right much more pressure on the yields much more pressure on interest rates so definitely there's a currency war going on between these uh governments and uh, uh, behind the scenes i wouldn't be surprised if there's so much pressure on both ends and this could, you know, this could create fireworks. And worst of all, it might create conflict and war uh, in the future, which, um, you know, you never know. It's it's really risky um, what's going on right now. Well, the, the neocons do want war. You know, Hillary Clinton was talking about uh, basically creating a no-fly zone in Syria. So, you know, the, the globalists have wanted war, World War III, for a while. But you brought up an interesting comparison there, comparing the president to the CEO of a company. You know, Trump, when he runs his companies, he had in basically full control. He could be a totalitarian if he wanted. He could fire people, hire people. Sure. He could change the allocation of capital into different sure. businesses or industries very quickly. I think once Trump got here, uh, you know, he has uh, the presidency – for decades now has accumulated enormous power for executive orders. But other than those executive orders, the president doesn't really have a lot of power anymore in the system. You know, um, like you said, uh, basically more than 80% of the government's budget for the next five years is already locked in. So there's not a lot. So Trump can't immediately go and say, you know, I'm shutting down this, uh, these 10 government agencies. We're firing every single government employee. We're not only limiting their budget, oh, we're yeah. getting rid of all these. He can't do that. Ronald Reagan sure. couldn't do that. Ronald Reagan couldn't sure. do that decades ago when the government was smaller. So I think, you know, the president just doesn't have as much control over. I, th I see this as a runaway train because of how big the you, government you, already is and the obligations it has. You touched it. That's that's exactly right. You touched, you know, the, the, the exact sweet spot. Trump, I believe he was absolutely shocked the first day in office. He couldn't believe how inefficient the system is compared to a business. And, and what I also think is growing up in Manhattan with all of these sharks, you know, real estate sharks around him. He thought he was in 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 the worst, you know, uh, in most competitive environment in the world. But you know, the kinds of political maneuvers that he, he sees probably in Washington makes him think like the the business world is is like La La Land compared to what's going on in Washington. It's probably a cesspool of, you know, uh, power greedy people that do things that uh, for their own egos and benefits they don't even care about the people anymore and like you say um and that's absolutely true the 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 kinds of uh changes that he can do in a four-year period are are you know sort of meaningless um and, and uh, to, to make a real change it takes so much more and i think um Look, the U.S. is is going through a huge change right now because the baby boomers who used to have um, the majority of, of the demographics being 80 million people out of the 325 million in, in the U.S. are now being surpassed by the, the millennials. And though um, half of the world's uh, private wealth is held by the baby boomers, um, the fear is that they'll start liquidating towards retirement and the millennials who earn uh, these assets and stocks. And so the real issue facing the United States right now is that Asia is growing in wealth, India, China, uh, Singapore, young countries, young demographics. And if, if this comes to a point where uh, the retirees cannot depend on government subsidies, they will have to sell 
and Asians will buy real estate in the U.S. Uh, in far greater number than they buy right now. They will buy U.S. stocks, and you'll see a huge, huge shift of wealth from west to east. And when that happens, then um, the, the gold, the gold standard, or, or perhaps the fiat monetary system, will look much differently because um, the, the Chinese and the Indians and the Russians have a far uh, uh, different outlook on how uh, a global uh, currency system should look like, and they've been accumulating um, precious metals for for uh, a, a number of decades. Obviously, uh, by the fact that Europe and the U.S. Are, are, is releasing it and liquidating it, and look, uh, this is a huge time to be an investor uh, because of what's going on. This has not happened in, in, in more than two, three hundred years where the the um, the shift from west to east has been this obvious. Uh, before we talk about gold and how the, the global financial system may reset, I want to talk on your points there about the tax cuts. You know, Trump, with the presidential power, he needs the help of Congress to get these things done, whether it's repeal health care, replace it with something better, to get those tax cuts. And it seems that neither party wants to help him. So he's being sabotaged by the mainstream media. He's being sabotaged by the Democrats. There, sure. Not only is there greedy and selfish people there who don't care about the people, like you said, there's also blind ideology people, especially in the Democratic Party, who, you know, they, they don't even want a Supreme Court justice who believes in the Constitution anymore. Hmm. So they have a certain agenda passed. They don't want to uh, help Trump really on anything unless he makes enormous compromises. So it's going to be very tough for Trump to get his domestic agenda passed unless he cuts deals with them and plays ball, which I think is what you're seeing with his foreign policy, where, you know, he's going along with some of these uh, head scratching people who voted for Trump are like, what is he doing? Why is he going along with these people's uh, foreign policy agenda now? So uh, it'll be very interesting to see uh, if Trump's willing to cut deals and do that. Um, you know, he has a history of uh, sacrificing principles to cut deals. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, you know, you said the wealth transfer from west to east. Uh, I've heard you on past interviews, Lior, talk about deflation a lot. I don't really see a lot of uh, evidence in the real economy or asset markets of deflation yet. We had brief period of deflation during 2009. We had credit dip very briefly. Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity did a video showing, you know, there was a tiny little dip in credit and that caused the 2008 financial crisis. And, you know, the central banks intervened. So um, do you think the central bankers are going to allow deflation or do you think then there's going to be like, a new type of intervention then well um interesting question and, and I'll, I'll answer it in two parts um first of all for, from a perspective of the uh, the money the money supply about 15 to 20 percent of the money supply of of the credit in the system is directly um the the direct uh or origin of it would be the federal uh reserve uh, bank. So when you see um, credit being created either by QE or by bond purchases um, from the Federal Reserve expanding its balance sheet, that is about 20% of the world's money supply. 80% of the world's money supply it comes and originates when you and I go to a bank branch and originate a mortgage or when we uh, swipe our, our credit cards, when we take a, um, an, uh, a car loan, whatever we do, that creates 80% of the money supply. So when you think if, if there's going to be deflation or inflation or hyperinflation, etc., um, the, the, the people control it much more than the government under the fiat monetary system, at least in the U.S., um, and, and obviously in, in, uh, um, in other Western countries where people are addicted to credit. So what you saw in 2008, uh, for instance, is the fact that uh, uh, there were no new credits. Um, uh, the amount of people going in to take a mortgage was less than the amount of people already took it. So you saw a credit crunch. Right now, this is not the situation at all. Um, most commercial banks in the U.S. Are, have access cash reserves. And uh, it's, it's actually uh, something that they're trying to uh, mitigate. So the Federal Reserve is trying to uh, um, raise rates because the banks will then want to uh, lend out these excess reserve cash because what they are doing now, because they got this cash 
are basically free from the from the Federal uh, Reserve. They're just buying uh, treasury bonds and making a two three percent arbitrage on their free money. Uh, for them, for for the uh, economy to incent- for for the economy to be incentivized to lend out to the consumer, they need to raise rates. Um, and then your mortgage broker will call you and say, look, uh, we're going to raise rates next month. Uh, would you want to take a mortgage now or next month? What are you going to do? So this is supposed to uh, create inflation again in the system, consumer inflation, because uh, when the U.S. government is doing these QEs with, uh, uh, with the Federal Reserve, it's, it's uh, far less effective because the money doesn't get to the main street, like like I just explained to you, it stays mostly at the commercial bank levels, and that and that's why you see the, this huge surge in the S and P 500, the Nasdaq, um, and the Dow Jones, and you don't see it in in, in your wages, right? You don't see um, uh, you, you don't see that change, and so the the central banks are out of conventional tools. They've lowered interest rates to zero. They've tried printing money. And the next stage for them, and this is not just Lear talking, um, Ray Dalio, who's the largest fund manager in the world, um, has also uh, been on this subject for, for a few months. The next stage for stimulus is some sort of a direct injection to the consumer. So uh, there's no other way to stimulate the economy any, uh, anymore with regards to, to credit creation. You've got to give money to the consumer. Um, and that's basically what Trump is trying to do on on, the, on his front, on his responsibility, lowering taxes, getting more discretionary income in the hands of the people. He, he thinks this will create uh, economic activity, etc. On, on the um, banking side, the Federal Reserve is trying to raise rates so the commercial banks will try to lend more money. Uh, the entire system is based on inflation. That's the way it, it is. It, it can't function in def- in uh in credit deflation, it, it, it just cannot. And so when the baby boomers were lending all of this credit to buy homes and cars and, and toys, etc., during the 80s and 90s, you had no problem. The problem started in the 2000s when they, when, when they didn't want to do it anymore. They were starting to retire and they didn't need to go out and take all this new debt. And therefore, we're in the final innings of what this uh, monetary system can do unless the agents come in and create another uh, credit boom. But that's going to be under their own, um, you know, their own terms. They're going to dictate terms. And who knows how that kind of world is going to look. But that, that could be um, far and away. So with, regard, with regards to either, if there's going to be deflation or hyperinflation or inflation or moderate inflation, etc., if the signs of deflation um, appear again, then central banks must intervene. There's just no other way. Otherwise, the system will, uh, it cannot exist. And you'll see what went on in 2008. Just just imagine, Jason, for yourself, if the government did not intervene in 2008, what would have happened? Um, obviously, I am in favor of them not doing anything in 2008 on a personal note. But for society, it would have been absolutely catastrophic, uh, especially in the U.S. where you got, uh, you know, 400 million guns. And uh, it, it, it would have been, uh, it would be insane um, for society. So this is a, a very, very risky system. And it all started with one chicken called Richard Nixon who couldn't admit that the U.S. government had been printing money in the 50s and 60s, and uh, he could have fixed everything back then by defaulting um, in, in coming out and saying, look, we don't have the gold, we need to reprice gold, whatever it would have taken. Instead of going on this 47-year, 46-year uh, uh, insane ride uh, and taking all of the all the world with him on this insane trip of this uh, non-tangible monetary system where we basically exchange um, notes that only have our trust behind them. 
Lior, I think there's been asset price inflation for, for decades now. I think the real economy, though, you know, I don't trust any of the government statistics, whether they're GDP, jobs, sure. uh, CPI. I don't I don't trust I don't whether it's the United States or China or Japan or Europe. I don't trust any of them anymore. There's just too much incentive for the governments to lie about these things and underreport them so they don't have to pay out cost of living adjustments or any of these other things. Uh, sure. They can see the economy is doing well. You know, Obama was saying how great the economy was doing, uh, you know, supposedly. Uh, the economy was creating all these jobs in restaurants and retail right at malls and look at all the the retail store closings and how restaurants are offering buy one get one free now in the united states just to get anyone in if the if those uh the, those industries were doing well they wouldn't have to be closing malls like crazy and stores like crazy and you know retail chains firing for filing for bankruptcy so um you know i think the uh, did you see that alan greenspan recently came out and said that the uh real economy is in really bad stagflation and he sees a lot worse stagflation so i'm not necessarily a hyperinflationist uh although because normally um no matter how much monetary inflation you put in, people can tolerate it for a long, long time. There needs to be a psychological component right. as well, or the um, or like that new system reset that you said, where the Russian, the Chinese say they won't accept dollars. That's the type of things that trigger a hyperinflation. So sure. in addition to all this gasoline that's poured on with a monetary inflation, they could keep pouring it on. But if um, people absorb it, it's only going to create stagflation for for longer and longer. So there's Correct. no guarantee we have a hyperinflation per se. We could just have stagflation for a long time. Sure. I definitely agree with that. Um, it, it, like I said, it's, it's a matter of trust and it's a matter of confidence at this point. And therefore, you know, the, the, the prudent thing to do is, is to have uh, – diversification in your life, politically, economically, um, and, and personally. So politically would be not, uh, perhaps not not uh, having one citizenship, maybe have multiple locations where you're welcome in the world. Um, financially, it would be diversifying your portfolio um, between several asset classes, um, obviously starting with, with the most protective ones and then uh, uh, going all the way through uh, the the pendulum to the most to, to the riskiest, speculative, and and most uh, rewarding ones if they pan out. Um, and then personally, you can you can you need to um, expand your skill set. You need to make sure that what you know and what you can execute is relevant uh, in the future. Where uh, jobs, certain jobs are going away, are being outsourced, etc. Uh, which is why I, which is why I think uh, the the marijuana legalization um, process in, in in the United States will be very beneficial because these jobs will not be outsourced. You will not outsource uh, the cultivation, extraction, uh, uh, all of that stuff. It, it, it's uh, it's quite an unsourceable market, and it's you know it's it's pretty big. It's large, and it's not even um, scratching the surface because big pharma cannot come in, big tobacco, big liquor cannot come in and you know uh, make acquisitions, make mergers, etc. Because it's it's still um, illegal on the federal level. But when you talk about um, uh, your portfolio, you've got to make sure that you have what we call uh, chaos hedges. So you know no one ever, no one has ever become rich by owning twelve insurance policies on his house. So it's this would be this, the same as not owning 100% of your uh, of your wealth in, in gold bullion. It just doesn't work that way. You won't um, you won't achieve what you're looking for. You should have a part of, portion of your portfolio in these types of chaos hedges like a gold bullion or a, or a gold bars, gold uh, um, coins, silver coins, etc. You can also have cryptocurrencies and offshore real estate as other safe havens. Getting a cash stash outside of the banking system is also very, it's like a, an emergency fund, right? Where you have it on hand, uh, maybe six months worth of living expenses, maybe 12 months. For me, it's 12 months, I'm just saying. And then you can take the other parts of your, of, of your net worth, which should be much larger. Um, 85 to 90% of your portfolio should not be in these chaos hedges for now, because like you said, and like I think, uh, it, um, Disruption and major disruption, major crisis of the system is not something that happens overnight. You can you can see it, and you can um, and 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 people have to realize when I say 10% in chaos edges, the 
that that type of percent grows with you. When you have when you get your income at the end of each month or, or for your business, then allocate some of that, and then your ten percent will always be larger than last month. It will still be ten percent, but it will be a substantial amount in a few years, right? So you gotta remember that. Mm-hmm. Um, for the most uh, for for most of your portfolio, you gotta be in cash producing assets. These would be the type of assets that will do well in in um, most economic environments, right? Which is usually what we live through. Where uh, I'm 33, um, uh, uh, I will be 33 this July. I've been investing since I was 16, and I've had two crises, uh, two crises in 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 that 16 year period. Most of the time, things are chugging along, right? So um, having your your uh, your wealth in cash producing assets grows your wealth. And then for the speculative part, in, in light of the fact that you know that precious metals are very undervalued because uh, 0.85% of the people, not even one in 100 people, owns gold or silver, then you know that when they resume, and if they resume any sort of status as backing the currency, even 40%, then you will see a an insane um, revaluation of the junior stocks and of the, uh, and the established gold and silver stocks. In fact, um, Preparing for this interview, Jason, I I, uh, um, I took the liberty of making something very special for your for your readers and listeners, and I created a watch list of the perfect and an ideal, the ultimate uh, stocks portfolio for um, for gold and silver and commodity investors at wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash watch list. And uh, look, uh, this is something I put out there, uh, it, it, with, obviously with no charge, so people can take a look at what quality companies um, can look like and they can put them on their watch list. So that's wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash watch list. So um, in my opinion, having your uh, portfolio diversified between these asset classes gets you uh, proper exposure, proper leverage, and um, risk mitigation, um, which is what you're looking for uh, in, in any sort of uh, in, in financial environment, either on a fiat monetary system or not. It's it's basically the same. You brought up a very interesting point there, uh, Lior, about diversification, and you know this is something I, I myself and my listeners who I talk to a lot. Uh, who comment underneath videos like this one when it's released will say, you know, Bitcoin has done very, very well recently. I think it's at an all-time high. It's at uh, $1,328 as we speak right now. And, you know, I know listeners who were gold and silver bugs, but because gold and silver has been manipulated, they've sold out of their gold and silver position and they've Mm -hmm. put a lot of money or all their money into Bitcoin. And, you know, just because it's doing well right now doesn't mean the people in power can't change the rules on the way they tax Bitcoin. They can go after all the Bitcoin exchanges. So, yes, they can't shut down the blockchain per se without shutting down the Internet. But there's ways for them to, uh, you know, change the rules and screw you over. So I think, you know, diversification, the only way to protect yourself is to, well, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know how... You know, the people manipulating gold and silver are going to figure out new ways to manipulate it. Uh, I think they can only manipulate it a, uh, a certain amount because if they destroy the miners, then they don't have any physical metal to deliver and then they can't manipulate it at all. So, um, you know, there's certain rules within these markets that you have to pay attention to. But, you know, betting all on silver or all on Bitcoin or all on junior mining stocks. I think that's very, very dangerous in this environment with politicians and central bankers changing the rules basically almost on a daily basis. Couldn't agree with you more. Um, look, the the mega trend that's right now shaping the world is the fact that in the last four months, so we're at the end of April, right? Um, the, the world has gained 225,000 new human beings every day. So in the, in the last four months, 27 million people have been added to our planet. And most of them are living in urban cities or mega cities. And that is putting a tremendous pressure on pollution and on gasoline cars. Um, and what you're seeing right now is a huge shift in, in uh, the sort of commodities that are needed in the future. Take zinc, for instance. 
Zinc is the third most in demand metal in the world. It's in severe short supply. Um, companies that, that are mining it are not directly mining it. So it's not like you can turn on the hose like an iron ore. It's a byproduct. Yes. It's a byproduct, it's most, right? Yes. Yeah. It's mostly a byproduct. And when you find it, it's, 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 uh, it's not in substantial amounts. For instance, a company that we're, we're looking at right now very actively at Wealth Research Group and, and following its progress um, is uh, exploring for silver. And because uh, uh, drill results can be very, very um, um, successful, then the valuations of land uh, where, where it only has the zinc in the ground, it's not even mined yet, right? It, uh, the leverage you can have to certain commodities like zinc and like cobalt is very interesting because cobalt, for instance, used to be a, a, a negligent metal. But right now it goes into every cell phone, every laptop and every lithium ion battery um, to the tune of more lithium, uh, more cobalt kilograms in every lithium battery than even lithium. You should even call them cobalt batteries and not lithium batteries, right? It's so important to modern day living and to the urbanization uh, and to the uh, introduction of electric cars that 50% um, of it comes from the Congo and about half of Congo mines are child, child labors. So you, look, Jason, only 2% of cobalt mining is directly. It, it's, it's, uh, it's a situation where we've never seen before a mineral that has turned from uh, being irrelevant to relevant so quickly. Um, and just just to you know, uh, to give you an example, a company that the Wealth Research Group follows right now very closely is called First Cobalt. Um, it's a Canadian company, and what they're doing, for example, is going into the Congo, but they're staying away from the the child labor mines, and they're moving into ethical cobalt in the anticipation that human rights groups are coming into the Congo and they're shutting down and stopping all of these mines. Now, when that happens, ethical cobalt uh, will explode in valuations or uh, large companies will try to buy out these small companies that, are, uh, that have stayed outside of that zone. So uh, it's very interesting what's going on with, with, uh, with this metal right now. And with zincs, for instance, you you know as well as I do, there's a company uh, that had that has had many successful drill holes and has had the backing of Sprott, for instance. It's called Kalanix Mines in um, in Canada as well, and they are having a, a simply a bonanza year by the fact that they're drilling and drilling and finding more and more um, zinc. So look, the 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 world is changing right now with regards to which commodities are important. Oil is becoming less and less important and other commodities like zinc. By the way, zinc is so important because China cannot do without it. It's it's used for galvanizing mostly. And because a third of, of uh, Chinese uh, cars are rusted, um, they need to change a third of their fleet of companies uh, for the citizens because these company, the, these cars are eroding. Um, they, they made them, you know, back when there was less regulation, et cetera. So uh, zinc is extremely important for their mega cities, which they're building to the tune of 50 million people, Jason, in one city. Um, I don't know if you've, if, if you've been uh, to that part of the world, but it's like, uh, it's insane. It, it's like walking on another planet. Um, truly a cultural change, it's amazing. Um, and, and that's the underlying theme right now going through commodities. So when you ask me about um, the, the commodity cycle, uh, the commodities have been on a downturn for many, many years, um, at least seven uh, or eight years. Some of these commodities have been downtrending and even the uh, and the shares have been lagging even more. And it looks like it's changing. Usually um, the shares, the 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 actual uh, companies that, that mine start to have um, a full throttle mode when the large companies, companies like Barrick and, you know, and Kinross, et cetera, when they start issuing dividends, institutional money comes in, pressures the management to increase dividends, 
And obviously, when you increase dividends, you've got to um, buy new uh, uh, new mines to exchange your depleting ones. And that's when they start uh, buying out smaller companies, and that fuels the entire sector. And we're starting to see that right now. Rio Tinto and um, Vale and BHP build, and they're they're starting to be more profitable than Tiffany's. Um, and, and, their, and their margins are insane. It's like ice cream. So the, the second stage here would be for them to start um, to start looking at, at the, the small companies and, and make acquisitions. Hopefully that will happen in the next one to three years. And like you said, with that 10% or 15% of your portfolio, where you dedicate to riskier assets and riskier um, uh, stocks and securities, you can make uh, uh, sizable and tiny positions that will work to your advantage, um, which is uh, always what the what uh, even what the billionaires do. But they cannot go into these smaller type firms. They, they go for uh, smaller for them, which is like a billion dollars. Where you can you and I can invest in companies that are mar- that have market caps of ten to fifteen million, and and they change over a course of a year to to hundred billion only because they made uh, a few successful drill holes. That happens all the time. There's a lot of looming supply problems in a lot of different commodity markets. The, the uranium market is one. A lot of uranium miners have been losing money for years. Oh, uh, definitely. Like you said, commodities. A lot of commodities have been in a bear market since 2011. I interviewed Doug Casey about a month ago on my on my uh, channel here, sure. and he said he travels all over the world, and he said a lot of farmers are losing money. So sure. you know, for a short amount of time, you can run a mine at a loss. You can run an oil well or a natural gas mine, uh, well at a loss. You can run your farm at a loss for a short amount of time. Eventually, though, you're gonna things are gonna have to turn around. The cycle is gonna have to turn. You're gonna have to make a profit, especially for mining companies, because you're pulling. You know, silver. I think is is one of the best no-brainers because uh, when I look at a lot of the primary silver miners right now, there's just no way they can replace all their mine reserves at the current silver price we have now, which is below. Uh, let me check Kitco real quick. It's yeah, it's below. Eight, we're at seventeen dollars thirty cents. I mean, most most silver miners now are are not even making a dollar or two dollars an ounce. The low-cost producers are doing making a couple bucks an ounce at the silver price, but they're not getting rich. So um, they're not going to be able to replace reserves at the, at these prices. And and if you touch about silver, let me tell you something. The because silver was held by so many governments before the Nixon default, they had to liquidate so much silver. It went into the markets, and uh, that excess amount of silver sustained all of these deficits over the years. Um, in the year two thousand. The, the amount of liquidated silver has is, is, is started to subside. And 17 years later, where we are right now, those stockpiles are all but gone. So uh, like you said, at these silver prices, there is no reserves anymore that would back the, the, the market up. And unlike gold, silver is, is by far more used um, as industrial. In fact, it's nearly... Uh, entirely trading like a, an industrial metal and not a precious metal, which is also the lure and, and the, the potential in it. If it ever becomes uh, monetized again, the, the, as you know, the, the original, or I shouldn't say the original, but the traditional ratio would be somewhere close to 16 to 1 and not 68 to 1. So um, obviously, if, if, if um, governments start to accumulate more, then you would see trading for much higher um, valuation. I couldn't agree more. With regards to uranium, it's one of the only commodities, it's one of the only metals in history to, to have a six-year bear market um, con, uh, consecutive without any moves up. And, um, well, we can all blame Fukushima for that, etc. cetera. The, the fact is about 90% of, of miners um, close shop in the last six, six years. So you're looking at a very tight market. And if, if um, uh, uh, Rick Berry, uh, which, is, who's the, uh, um, which is at the uh, energy uh, department, uh, we all know he was the, government tech, uh, the governor of Texas and they had uh, producing um, uranium mines when he was uh, a governor. So I don't see any political problems with that. And in fact, Jason, this is, it's so stupid because 
um, the BP oil uh, crisis, right, when it stained the entire Gulf of Mexico, did not stop oil. So how come Fukushima stopped the entire world from um, from uh, using uranium? Uh, the fact is, it's it's a it's a touchy matter, right, because of the um, the radiation, etc. But uh, over the long term, technologies are getting better and more refined. It's getting safer. It's cheaper. It's a much better source of energy. And uh, unless another political uh, disaster happens, I see uranium prices moving much, much higher. And the existing miners, you know, you can bet your ass, these are very, very safe companies because they, they were able to raise money, sustain their business models throughout um, the bear market, they will do exceptionally well in the bull market. Well, Lior, I could talk about commodities with you, I think, uh, for a while, maybe over a beer, but um, we've, we've been going for, uh, I have a conference call in a few minutes. I want to thank you for your time. And uh, if our listeners want to follow your work more, and uh, how do they do so? Well, the Wealth Research Group is the, is the website. Um, the best thing to do is go into the website and then on the top, menu, use the left two tabs, one that says wealth stocks, one that says special reports. That's where we have our highest conviction uh, research. And as I said, um, if, you're, if you're looking for exposure to the actual um, uh, resource uh, sector and, and the natural resource stocks, then go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash watch list where I created a special um, watch list report with the companies that we follow very, very closely. Um, so you can um, um, incorporate them in your watch list um, going forward. Wall Street for Main Street needs your help. YouTube stole $7,200 from Wall Street for Main Street in annualized YouTube AdWords revenues, and they kneecapped our analytics down by more than 80% across the board since September 2016 with their new censorship algorithms to stop the rapid growth of our channel. That was money we could have used to upgrade our website, pay bills, and invest in improving our content and growing our business. Our audience of loyal listeners is all over the globe and so large now that if most or all of our listeners were to commit to donating $1 to $5 each month to our Patreon account, we could easily meet our goal on Patreon. Wall Street for Main Street also accepts one-time donations on our main wallstreetformainstreet.com website, that's W-A-L-L, stforminst.com website via PayPal, gold money, or Bitcoin. We also accept donations of physical precious metals that can be mailed to us. Thanks to all listeners who have already made a donation, and thanks in advance to any listeners who make a future con uh, donation or contribution to the growth, improvement, and success of Wall Street for Main Street.